for joining me here today for another cooking style video. Um, nothing on my fingers or nails today because today we're going to be doing bread. Now I thought I would talk about this because I'm doing something very specific for today but I also did something yesterday which I can show you so you get a bit of an idea of what I do with bread as well. Now someone in the comments of my last video talking about you know doing home cooking and stuff for my family uh, mentioned should I get a bread maker. And I used to have a bread maker a long time ago, but I've kind of moved on from that. We sold it and gave it away to someone we know. And I have been making my own bread for quite some time, uh, as you might have suspected, because I do like to do stuff myself. Now, I made a nice loaf of wholemeal brown bread uh, yesterday. Believe it or not, this is genuinely my cooking. So um, just to, to discuss this, this is my loaf of wholemeal bread that I made yesterday. If you, if you need to, you can see the tin it came in. So that's my wholemeal loaf I made yesterday. As you can see, we had some for breakfast this morning. And this is a nice tin loaf. So I made it using one of my um, sort of uh, loaf tins, which are really nice for all sorts of stuff I use them for multiple things, including pâtés and other bits and pieces as well in the right time of year. I put a few seeds in this one, a few sunflower seeds, and not too many actually, I put way too little actually. I put some sunflower seeds and some pumpkin seeds in as well. You can just about see one of the seeds here. But this is the kind of bread that I would produce. Now I don't do all of our bread at home because bread takes quite a lot of effort and time. And it's a difficult thing to make sometimes. It can be, Unpredictable. It's definitely a sort of art to making bread and I've had my fair share of disasters. This one was really good. I like wholemeal. I find it is, if anything, it's more encouraging for me to use the white bread flour because the white strong bread flour, I generally find that I have a tendency to under knead it. With wholemeal, because I, needs, I know it needs that much more, I'm going to really go for it with the wholemeal. I'm going to pack in a lot of kneading, and then I tend to get better um, results. Now, what I tend to do is I will use my KitchenAid, which I will use to kind of prepare most of my dough, but I will kind of combine that with my own kneading as well. So I'll do about three quarters of the kneading using the machine and then I'll take it out and do the rest of the kneading myself just to finish things off and make sure I've kind of you know got my hands into it and I'm happy with the texture before it is left to rise. Now for today we're going to do something a little bit different because tomorrow I'm going out with my family and we're going to do a kind of long walk type thing so we need something to keep us going and I happen to have a few ingredients that I want to try and use up in my fridge, in my cupboard, and they're all going to come together to make lardy cake. Now, if you don't know what lardy cake is, it's quite fattening. It uses lard, as the name would imply, and it is a bread. It's not a cake, it's a bread. It uses, the recipe that I'm using is about 250 grams of strong white flour. You would uh, mix that to the usual quantities of salt and yeast. So I like to over boost the yeast on this because it's quite heavy, it's got a lot of fruit in it, it's got sugar in it, and it has lard in it. Now for the lard, I'm actually using my own lard that I've made at home, which I'll just grab and show you. So this is the lard that I made. Last time we did a pork belly that we did for bacon. I made bacon and pancetta out of the pork belly. I took the flare fat from the inside of the pork belly, put it in the oven on a low heat in a sort of Pyrex dish, and just rendered out the fat from it. It makes the best sort of, as you can see, pure white lard, which is fantastic for roast potato stuff like that. It just keeps it in the fridge. I mean, this is months old and it's still good now. It's, it's really, really great stuff. So. This has been knocking around for some time. It's basically just about enough that I need to be able to make this particular bread. And I'm sort of thinking that this would be a good way to use this up, along with a few bits of dried fruits, currants, sultanas, raisins, that kind of stuff that I've had left over from the winter time. You know, I use a lot of that in fruit cakes and stuff during winter when we're baking, but during the summer, I don't use so many of those kind of dry ingredients. This is a nice way of using up whatever happens to be knocking around in the cupboard. And because it's quite fattening, it's got a lot of sugar in it, it's definitely energy food. 
it's you know it's got pig fat in it it's not the uh the lightest thing it's not good for someone if you're on a diet but it is incredibly moorish one thing i will say about lightly cake is there's loads of different recipes and i just tend to chuck in whatever i happen to have to hand i've put glacé cherries in mine when i had some left over i have soaked fruits in alcohol to sort of plump them up before putting them in i've done all sorts of stuff with lightly cakes in the past but the basic ingredients are it's a bread dough with lard sugar and it will or will not have some combination of dried fruits mixed peel that kind of stuff your typical wintry sultanas raisins currant mixed peel you know your lemon orange mixed peels that kind of stuff and all blended in together now what I'm going to do first, I'm going to get the dough on and I'm going to get that rising because that's going to need about an hour to rise and prove. And then we'll do the rolling out and it can be a bit tricky, it's sometimes a little bit of an irritant this one. But we'll see how it goes and um, yeah, do what we can. Okay, so I'll just talk you through what I've done so far. I've got my bowl here, I've got my flour and my salt in here already. Just kind of mix those up together because the yeast... That I'm doing with this one isn't powdered yeast, or rather it is, but I'm actually doing it from um, active yeast. So I'm going to be dissolving sugar in some water. So I've got 150 ml of warm water here, two thirds cold to one third boiling. And I'm just going to put a teaspoon of sugar into there. So a teaspoon of just regular caster sugar. And we dissolve that in so that it's going to use that sugar to feed the yeast. So that dissolves pretty quickly. And then into there, we put in a tablespoon of yeast. Now, you always have to make it up this way. So you always do 150 ml of warm water with a tablespoon of yeast and a teaspoon of sugar. You can then add on top, you know, that would normally do about 500 grams of flour. That would be suitable for about 500 grams of white bread flour. This recipe calls for less white bread flour, but I'm gonna to top it up slightly with a bit more, and I'm gonna boost the yeast content, just because with so much extra stuff in here, you know, the amount of um, fruit and heavy stuff that's in here, I want to get a decent rise on it, and I don't want it to take too long. So I'm just going to mix this up together, and we have to leave this to start to ferment. Now in about 10 minutes, this will have started to froth up and bubble up, as the yeast, which has been activated by the water, starts to eat the sugar and begins to metabolize. That's what's going to help our bread rise because the carbon dioxide that's released by the yeast is the air that helps grow our bread, helps it rise. So this is all kind of nicely mixed in, that'll do quite nicely. You want to try and whisk it a little bit or just stir it around until it's really nicely blended in. And you don't have any big lumps, basically. That will do. So it's now kind of muddy water. I'm just going to leave that for 10 minutes just to start to grow and start developing that culture. Now, while I'm doing that, I'm going to need to melt a little bit of lard because we're going to put some lard into the dough. Only about 10, 15 grams, something like that, depending on how much you're using. So, uh, like I said, I'm using a little bit of extra bread. I'm making a slightly larger one this time just because I want to have a bit more bread and that way I'm not going to have any issues with trying to get the fruit into it because in the past I've always had problems with the bread splitting because I find that this recipe gives me too little bread for the fruit fillings that I'm putting in. So I'm just going to slightly boost it up a little bit and give it a bit of an extra welly. But if you were using 250 grams of flour you would be making about, you've got five grams of dried yeast, five grams of um, salt would go into there as well. You can add sugar into the mix, it's absolutely fine, just to help the yeast start going inside the bread. And then you wouldn't actually need any more water because around about 150 mils of water is, or liquid, it could be milk, it depends on what you're doing with your bread, is suitable for 250 grams of flour. If you are doing like a normal kind of loaf size thing like I did yesterday, then I do 500 grams of flour, 300 mils of water. It's a nice kind of mix up. But like I said, you can use warm milk as long as it's going to be of sort of room temperature and above that kind of lukewarm blood temperature. So it doesn't feel like it's any different to the temperature of your hand. That is a good temperature to 
be starting the uh, proving process with the bread. This bread is one that we used to get from a local baker's in my hometown. So when I was a boy, we used to go out to my hometown, go to local baker's, we would um, get a nice like sort of wedge of lily cake. And back then from that baker, that was the one that I always, always sort of measure everything else by. It was incredibly rich, it was packed full of fruit, and it was really sort of sugary with caramelized sugar all on the outside. And it was kind of stodgy and, but really, um, and really, really flavorful and moist, very, very moist. Now, some places where I go today, if you buy lily cake, I find that what they seem to be doing is they're basically making a fruit bread and then they're dipping it in sugared um, syrup to be able to get a sort of coating. They really aren't like the way they used to be. You know, I know everyone says that, but you know, a lily cake should be layered. It should have layers of bread and fruit and bread and fruit. And what I tend to find is they come out like a fruit bread where fruit has just been mixed into the, the dough and then it's kind of introduced to lard or to the sugaring process at a later stage. And it should kind of bake all together in one thing. The sugar, the lard should all be enclosed within the bread as it bakes. It's gonna escape, the lard's gonna escape. There's no way to avoid that. But you can do stuff about that once it's actually finished. But they don't seem to do that anymore. It doesn't seem to, or at least some of the places I go to, my local a garden center, they sell a few lardy cakes and they're just dry and they're just fruit bread. It's not like what I remember. There is a place in Burford. There's a nice place called Huffkins in Burford and they have a really nice lardy cake they do. It's still not as good as the ones that I um, you know, used to get when I was a kid. And that's not just me looking back with sort of, you know, the, the hindsight and, you know, rose tinted glasses of hindsight. They genuinely, you know, they're, they're as close as I've managed to find in terms of commercial. It may be to do with, you know, fat content and healthy eating and stuff like that. Maybe it's to do with cost cutting, but it seems to be generic. Um, I bet if you go up north, if you go up to Northumberland or other areas where these lardy cakes are really you know, strong and a very proud tradition to them, I bet you'd find something that's more like what I was getting when I was a boy, you know, 30, 30 odd years ago. Now, doing it at home, you can put as much lard in as you want, you can make it as unhealthy as you want. As long as you then go for a really, really nice walk and you burn off some of that extra energy, then it's all good for you and you can just eat smaller pieces, it's absolutely fine. This thing warm is gorgeous. Cold, it's lovely as well, but warm, it's amazing. Um, we're gonna have ours cold tomorrow. So, um, in the time I've been talking, this has happened to the uh, yeast. So you can see that here, we have the level of the water. And all of this is the actual bubbling up, frothing up on top. So this is getting to the point where I can add it to the bread and it's gonna be the right kind of consistency. Now, it's 150 mils of water. I'm kind of doing one and a half batches. So I'll need another 75 mils of water, but I'm gonna do that by eye based on how well I like the texture of the dough it's forming. Um, and we'll see how it goes. I don't like to add too much. I do like to make sure that before it comes out of the machine, it's at the texture that I like to knead it. I hate kneading dough that's sticky. I don't like kneading sticky doughs. It's not my f idea of fun. Um, and I prefer a dough that's at the level where I can actually kind of uh, handle it without needing to you know, scrape dough off my hand every five minutes just to be able to work it properly. Uh, that I find quite irritating. There are plenty of breads that need to be done like that, especially kind of enriched doughs, brioches, that kind of stuff. But you know, that's why I like this kind of baking. It's much better for it. I shall add this into the mixer and we'll just get that going around to make sure the salt and you know the flour are nicely incorporated. There's no way you can avoid the yeast making contact with the salt in this one. If you're using dried yeast or um, you know the actual powdered yeast, if you have it directly in contact with salt, the salt will start to kill it. So generally if you're making a dough where you're putting in teaspoons of dried yeast, teaspoons of salt, you keep them separated in the bowl, and that way the salt won't be killing the yeast. Because this is already a liquid and it's going quite crazy as you can see, this is gonna get everywhere instantaneously, so it's not gonna create any problems like that. But again, you wouldn't wanna pour it straight onto a big lump of salt that's sat in the middle of your bowl. So this yeast is now going crazy. Definitely the right time to put it in. It's frothing up as you can see. Just gonna knock some of that air out of it. 
But that's shown me that the culture is developing and it's basically good to go in. So we will get ready with this. Start the machine up. And I just like to, I'll, I can add all of this because this is definitely not going to be enough liquid to cause me a problem. And I'll then get a bit more roughly what I think is right and we'll top it up. Using the machine is a bit cheeky. It's not as cheaty as using the bread machine, but it is a bit cheaty because it's going to do most of the hard work. I'm not in the mood to do that today. I'm quite happy to just finish this off when I'm ready. And it helps just take uh, some of the labour out of doing this. It's nice when you use this, but I do like to finish it off by hand. It's nice to touch the bread and, and you know get that feel of how you like it at the end. Anyway, let's have a look. I'll stop that. One tip with bread is that when you're using a machine like this, if you just leave the, if you kind of incorporate the ingredients together, get it into a rough dough and then leave it for a few minutes, just, just to let the flour absorb some of that moisture and it will knead much easier. It's a nicer way to, to kind of get things going. So I've got a bit more water in here just to top up the amount I added in with the yeast. I'm just going to try and get this to the point where I'm happy with the consistency. I'm ready now to start the mixing, but I've just put the lard in. So the lard has been melted in the pan, just pour that into here. I'm now going to add a little bit more flour because it's a little bit moist than I want, just to try and get the right consistency. The main point we know the consistency is right, it's when the machine is picking up all of the little bits from the side because you're going to get some dough and stuff that's stuck on the side. So once the machine picks all those bits up, you kind of know you're ready because it should effectively be clean on the inside of the bowl as it mixes and incorporates everything into the overall mixture. Okay, so I'll just show you what this looks like. I'm not going to get it any closer, but there is my dough on the end of there looking pretty, pretty good. Might need a bit extra, but I'm just going to leave that for a few minutes just to absorb the water and the moisture into the flour, which hopefully will take away a bit of the stickiness. And I may need to add a touch more flour, we'll see. But I'll just leave that for a few minutes and then we'll come back to it and we'll get this kneading for about seven to eight minutes and then I'll try and finish things off by hand. Okay, so while I'm waiting for the dough to sort of absorb that moisture, I'm just gonna weigh out everything else that I need. So I'm going to start measuring out the ingredients that I need to add into this. I'm going to be using dried mixed fruits. I've got this bag of mixed stuff, which has got candied peel in there. It's got uh, sultanas, raisins, currants, that kind of stuff, all mixed in together. I'm going to use, well, the recipe calls for 150 grams of this, which is roughly equal amount of fruit to, let's say, the mills of water that you add. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to top that up because I'm making a slightly larger one. So I'll probably go to about 200 grams of the mixed fruit. And then we add in sugar. The recipe is 50 grams of caster sugar. I'm going to again boost that up to about 75. Toss it all together with some ground cinnamon. And then that becomes our mix that gets spread in with the lard into the bread once it's proven and once we've rolled it out. And we need to kind of prepare that, get it all ready, and it's going to go into the oven. Okay, now all we do with this, all here together, is just kind of toss it around together. And that cinnamony, sugary, fruity mixture is going to go in the lard inside the bread, and then going to bake in the oven. The lard will melt inside. The bread should rise in between layers, but the lard will melt. And as it melts, it will come out. You can't avoid that. But as it comes out, what we're going to do at the end is on the base, you should get this really nice caramelized bit where the sugar and the lard has come out and really coated the base. As soon as it's cooked and ready and we take it out, we flip it and any lard that has come out will be reabsorbed back into the top layer, which otherwise might be a little bit dry. So it's a nice way of making sure that you kind of get the mixture and the, uh, let's say, that kind of juiciness all into both ends rather than having a nice um, caramelised, delicious, juicy bottom, if you want to put it that way. And then a dry top, which you don't want. So we're ready to go. That's had enough time. I'm just going to leave this to knead now. So just knead it on slow speed. 
Okay, so the dough is basically ready for me to knead it a little bit by hand. Just get a feel for how good the texture is. If I need to add a little bit more flour, I'll knead that into it by hand from now. It's a little bit sticky, but basically good to go. So this is the dough that we've got prepared. Nice, it's got good elasticity in it already. It's still nice and warm from when we put the warm water in and that warm lard went in as well. So I'm just, I'm just gonna push this around a bit. So in terms of technique, some people would, you know, prefer to push away and hold, roll, what you're basically trying to do is break it, stretch it, roll it back up, stretch it, and you're looking for the dough to get to a nice sort of elastic consistency. The machine will do this all on its own. The only reason to take it out and do this is so that you know and you get the feel for what it feels like as you're doing it. Otherwise, there's no real need to do this with the machine. But at least this way, if it is over or under, in terms of how well it is needed, it's your fault. And it's not just something where you left the machine on for too long. So it's very hard in terms of time, you know, to over knead bread, because it takes a long time to knead it. But this is a nice way to get sort of hands on at the end. So one of the tests of bread is if you take a piece, you know, can you stretch it? I can pull this pretty well, it's breaking slightly, but it's getting pretty well to the point where I can kind of make it see through and the texture is sort of getting there. This is very close, so I'm kind of happy with this. You know, being lazy as I am, and not being, you know, not having always too much time to be able to do everything, I would probably just leave this, and this would be fine. So now I need to form this into a round. And the easiest way to do that is just to press it down, and then fold in, the sides. So we fold in our sides like so, flip it and then just use a sort of chopping action to spin it and turn it into a nice round and that is ready to be proved. So, okay so my bowl's now nice and dry, nice and clean I'm going to drop my dough into there. Now, some say you could grease this or flour it. This type of dough, I don't want to flour it. And I'm not going to grease this either. I'm just going to rely on the sort of natural sort of properties of the dough where I've got lard in this to try and keep it from sticking to the bowl too much. Um, so I'm just going to drop it in like so. And then I'm going to cover this up. Now, what I use this, I use a bin liner. Use a nice clean bin liner. Wrap it round, you can get some air in there as well, but it creates a nice sort of shield on this. So this kind of white bin liner is ideal. You can just put a moist cloth over this. Um, some people would have you cover it with a, you know, a plate or something, but I quite like this, especially because what you can do with a bin liner, if you can pop it inside, you can then scrunch it up and you can trap air inside. So this air, if you've got something that's gonna rise quite a lot, this air means you can keep it elevated over the top. For example, if you're trying to prove rolls, you can put a tray of rolls inside this with air above them. So it's going to keep the actual plastic from sticking to your rolls, which is great. In this case, I just need to cover the surface. So I don't need it to be super, you know, airy inside and have loads of space because there's no way this should prove to the point where it's going to get above here. It should be getting up to about um, halfway to two thirds of the way up the bowl. If it goes to the top of the bowl and starts hitting this plastic, I'd let it overprove, and that would be 
essentially not the best thing for it anyway. So we'll just leave this for, check it in 45 minutes, maybe an hour, see how we go. So if you're in a warm area, it's quite nice to do these in kind of warm room temperature type areas. Um, I could leave it to prove in this room today, that's perfectly fine. If it's winter time and it's cold, a good place to prove bread is in your airing cupboard. So if you've got a hot water tank that's constantly keeping your hot water available for you, then that area is going to be of a nice, decent temperature to pop this in. So create a little space in there, pop whatever you're proving into that area so it's got decent warmth, even if your house is cold or whatever else. Okay, so welcome back. I know I was gone for so long that my hair changed colour and that he grew longer. Now the dough has finished rising, as we can see here. So it's grown from its original size to this kind of, you know, big boy size. And what we need to do now is we need to actually deflate this and start rolling it out. So I'm going to use my rolling pin, a little bit of flour just to stop things sticking. I'm going to use my nice heavy rolling pin just to get this out to a decent sized rectangle that we're then going to cover with some of our ingredients, roll it up, etc., and then get it all in, uh, in kind of good fashion, ready to cook. And we'll start by knocking this back. So just get your hands in. There we go. Scrape all this off the inside. Don't want to waste any. That's the extra we scraped off. We put that all together and we can just knock the air out of this and we can think about rolling this out. Now I want this to be about a centimetre thick. We want to get a nice sort of rectangular shape, about a centimetre thick, and we're going to want to spread our filling into that along with that lard. So let's put a little bit of flour down. Now with the lard, I'm just going to distribute this in small pieces as follows. So just dot this around wherever you can. Okay, so that's enough lard basically into here. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to spread on about half of this mixture. With these. Just sort of spread that liberally around. And what you're going to find as you roll this up, that it gets really quite sort of lumpy and you're going to get bits kind of bursting out. There's not much you can really do about that. But if I just roll this like so, I get a reasonably nice tight roll. Just the ends are nice and flat. And we want to try and make sure that we've got a nice sort of seal on it so as we press it down so what you'll see is you'll start to see the fruit showing through slightly which is nice it's kind of what you want but because my lard is quite soft it's going to squish nicely rather than being in lumps throughout here. So I'm just going to turn that round so that again I'll be able to roll it up. So the ends as you can see haven't got much in them so all the filling is kind of here in the middle but now we're going to add this and roll it up from this end so that's going to increase that. So what we'll do is we'll just distribute more of this back over the top, more lard creating layers essentially in the bread with lard inside. So now we'll just distribute the rest of the fruit and the sugar and the cinnamon on top. And then once more we'll roll this up. So try and get a nice tight-ish roll, not too many air pockets. Try and get that bread dough nicely distributed 
around there. So now just going to leave this at that width here. I'm just going to roll this out, tuck that in the back there. Try and squidge down the ends, make sure they're not going to pop. And just try and roll this out to a nice, decent size. So I'll put it in this smaller one. I'm just going to use a bit of this lard to grease the smaller pan. So we can get some of that lard in there. That will help prevent it from sticking. And we'll just drop this in like so. So push it out to the edges. Nice kind of shape to fill this up. Done. So this is all now ready to leave to rise again. Give it about another 30 minutes, so half an hour to rise. I'm going to cover it up with the uh, bin liner again just to make sure it's all nice and sealed and keeping all that moisture inside so it's not going to dry out because drying out will prevent it from rising. So we'll get this to puff up a little bit. Hopefully because the extra yeast I've got in, all of that lard and the heaviness of the fruit isn't going to impair that rising process too much. And that's why I put a little bit of extra yeast in there just to give it a bit of a boost. Otherwise it can be a little bit, um, a little bit lacking in layers. But that's come out really quite nicely. As you can see, it's a nice sort of little bit showing through. Those will brown on top and be really quite pleasant. So leave that for half an hour, get the oven up to 200 degrees and we'll be ready to go. Okay, in the meantime I'll do a little bit of tidying, get this place sorted out and we'll be ready to crack on with the baking of this as soon as it's finished rising. So the allotted writing time is now finished. As you can see we've got some growth on this, it's sort of risen decently in certain places. It doesn't matter too much in areas it's a bit lumpy. Like I said, this is the kind of thing that um, will spring up quite well in the oven but it's not going to rise massively. One of the main things is that it rises more at the ends here because where we folded it over and rolled it, there's just more dough in there. So that's going to actually project it a little bit higher. But that's looking pretty good, happy. We'll put it in the oven. It'll take about 30 to 40 minutes. Keep an eye on it after 30 minutes just in case it's browning too much. Looking for a nice golden brown on top. 200 degrees centigrade, that's in a fan oven. If you're gonna do it in a non-fan oven, you'll need to put the temperature up by about another 20 degrees. So it's been about 35 minutes since this went into the oven, roughly-ish. So time to get it out, have a little look at it, see what it looks like. So oven gloves, because this dish is going to be super hot, we don't want to burn ourselves. Let's have a quick peek. That looks very nice. So you can see the colour on this. Nice looking sort of golden brown colour on that. Nice hard crust. I don't want to do anything more with that. Mm. I'll just show you this. You can see the uh, lard is somewhat coming out the side, look. So you can see where that's coming out the side. What we need to do is we want to flip this over so that all of that is absorbed back into the top of this. And what you can see now is the base. So inside here, nicely risen, that is the base of our lardy cake. So any caramelised goodness that's in there, we'll scrape that all off the bottom later. We're going to leave that for about 10, 15 minutes just to cool down. So let that cool, then we'll pop it on a wire rack just to completely cool. It can be sliced up and served at that point or it can be kept until later. But you can see it's now got a really nice sort of rise on it. So this has got a nice, nice height on it right up to the top. So it's actually come up quite high and I'm just going to get all those lovely good caramelized bits. I'm really happy with this actually, it's, it's kept its form really well and not much of the lard has come out which is great because it means that it's been trapped inside and it will be keeping the inside hopefully lovely and moist. Once it's cooled I will cut a slice and I'll either video that or I'll take a little bit of a picture of it and stuff and show you what it looks like when it's finished. But that's my lardy cake that I've done today, ready for our picnic tomorrow. Looking forward to giving that a try. Oh, that bottom sounds lovely. It's delicious. Now, I went for a run this morning. 
around 10 kilometers, which means I've earned a slice of lardy cake. And therefore I may have a small little cube at some point later this evening. Anyway, thank you for joining me for this video. I'll do a little bit afterwards showing maybe some cutting or something along those lines. So if you stick around right to the end, you'll see something more about what it looks like and perhaps what it looks like when I'm actually eating it or something along those lines. But I'll see, it depends on how long I'm dressed like this for for the rest of the day. But otherwise, I shall let you go there. So that's my lardy cake. Hope you enjoyed this, hope that was of interest to you. If you've got any questions, let me know in the comment section down below. If you're interested in the recipe and you want to know where to get it from, I've got this recipe from my River Cottage bread book. So I have these books, which I use. This is the River Cottage Handbook for Bread. Uh, it's a fab book. I went to River Cottage to do a few uh, courses and stuff on how to prepare meat, stuff like that. I've done all my bread stuff at home, but I find this is a very nice, simple way. It's got good explanations on, on bread and you know how you need to kind of treat it, mix in the dough. It's a nice read. I like reading about food and reading about how you can do these kind of things um, really well and with some, let's say, close to professional results. So very pleased that today. It's come out super well. If you're interested in the recipe, you can find it in here. Um, otherwise, just try something at home. Just get over the fact that it's got lard in it, it's got pork fat in it. It's delicious, you won't taste it, it doesn't taste of animals or anything else like that. It's all rendered down, it's absolutely gorgeous. Anyway, thanks for being here today. Hope this is of interest to you. Any questions, let me know in the comment section down below. Or you can reach me through my email address, julietteisnoir at gmail.com or the website julietteisnoir.uk. Look forward to talking to you all again in the next video. And as ever, bye. Bye.